أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We've been discussing the battle of Khaybar, which is one of the major battles of Islam, as many of you know. In our last episode, we spoke about the, <clears throat> the conquering of the fortress of Na'am, which was the specific fortress that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was able to capture. As you recall, Khaybar was a territory that... Uh, that was comprised of a number of fortresses. And ultimately, the Muslims were able to, of course, under the leadership of Imam Amir al Mu'minin, they were able to uh, penetrate and capture the most important fortress. And ultimately, uh, the Jews of Khaybar uh, surrendered after losing control of uh, many of their fortresses. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to share with you guys a brief uh, reflection on one of the passages that we find in Dua and Nudba. Dua and Nudba, uh, according to the Shi'i tradition, is a supplication that was composed by the twelfth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Al Mahdi Al Muntadar. And it's a dua that is recommended to be recited on the four ayad, the four eids. And it's recited by believers on a weekly basis, particularly on Friday morning. And it's a dua where we basically lament the, the loss and you know, our inability to directly access the divinely appointed uh, guide. And the dua begins with, uh, the story of, of divine guidance, beginning with Adam and then the prophets of great resolve and then the Prophet and then the, the system of guidance that was put in place uh, after the Prophet in the form of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And of course, the, the Ummah did not appreciate the guidance of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and ultimately the final Imam, the 12th Imam, is in a state of occultation. In any case, one of the, the lines that we read in this dua is where we say, we make a reference to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, and we read, وَقَتَلَ أَبْطَالَهُمْ وَنَاوَشَ ذُؤْبَانَهُمْ He, meaning Ali ibn Abi Talib, killed their champions and took down their wolf-like heroes. If you look at the battles of Islam, not only did Amir al-Mu'mineen السلام, display valor and courage, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was the one who took down the most ferocious warriors in those battles. And it was the Imam's heroics that almost always raised the morale of the Muslim army. وَقَتَلَ أَبْطَالَهُمْ وَنَاوَشَ ذُؤْبَانَهُمْ فَأَوْدَعَ قُلُوبَهُمْ أَحْقَادًا بَدْرِيَّةً so this passage of the dua says that he, meaning Ali, killed their champions and took down their wolf-like heroes and thus planted in their hearts hatred because of Badr, Khaybar, Hunayn, and other battles. Now the battle of Khaybar here is mentioned as one of the, the accolades of and one of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this passage of the dua highlights that what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did in Badr, in Khaybar, in Hunayn was that there was a lot of hate that was implanted in the hearts of the people towards him. Now with respect to the battle of Khaybar, the hatred and the animosity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib was twofold. 
So on one level, the Jews felt the sting of Ali's sword when he killed their champion, Marhab, and he led the charge which ultimately brought down the fortresses of Khaybar, specifically the fortress of Na'im. So in the battle of Khaybar, Ali became the one who was most hated by the Jews because he is the one who caused their downfall. And in addition to the, the, the Jewish hatred towards Ali, you see on the second level, certain Muslims, certain Sahaba felt their pride injured by their own failure. If you recall, Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was given the standard after some prominent companions like Abu Bakr and Umar failed to uh, bring down uh, the fortress. So the leaders of these failed expeditions felt the flames of jealousy uh, rekindled. And in fact, we have a, a statement by Sheikh Al-Mufid, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, who died in the year 413 after the Hijra. So we're talking about a thousand years ago. Sheikh Al-Mufid has many uh, publications. He has, has, he has he's published many books. Among them is a book called Al-Jamal, which is a, an analysis of the battle of Jamal, which is one of the, the civil wars that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib led during uh, his Khilafah. On page 219, Sheikh al-Mufid, he writes, and of course he's drawing these, uh, this information from, uh, from earlier uh, historical accounts. He says, وَقَالَ لَهُمْ ظَاهِرًا مُعْلِنًا The Prophet ﷺ, uh, during the campaign, during the military expedition in Khaybar, he announced, لَأُعْطِيَنَّ الرَّايَةَ غَدًا رَجُلًا يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولًا The Prophet stood after Abu Bakr and Umar uh, failed uh, to conquer the fortress. He says, Verily, tomorrow I will give the standard to a man who loves Allah and his messenger. وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And whom Allah and His Messenger also love. So it's a reciprocal love. كَرَّارٌ غَيْرُ فَرَّارٌ The Prophet ﷺ, he says, this is someone, this is a man who is karrar. Meaning, he's not someone who's going to turn back and retreat. He's someone who's going to advance forward. No matter how many times it takes, he will always move forward. He will never turn his back. Karrarun غَيْرُ farrar. Farrar means the one who runs away, the one who retreats. Unlike his predecessors, Ali is karrar. In fact, one of the, the names of Ali, one of the titles of Ali is Al-Karrar. Haydar Al-Karrar. The one who you know, is, uh, is persistent, who moves forward who ambushes without retreating multiple times. Someone who doesn't retreat. لا يرجع حتى يفتح الله على يده. He will not come back. Meaning the Prophet is saying that when I send Ali ibn Abi Talib and I give him a task, he will not come back until Allah grants him victory. So Ali, he says, فَأَعْطَانِ الرَّايَ Ali says, the Prophet gave me the standard on the day of Khaybar. فَصَبَرْتُ And I remain patient. right? So because to conquer a fortress requires uh, steadfastness. It requires patience. حَتَّى فَتَحَ اللَّهُ عَلَى يَدِي Until Allah conquered the fortress through my hands. And then the Imam, he says something very interesting. And this is very, very important for us to reflect upon. He says, فَغَمَّ ذَلِكَ أَبَاهَا The Imam, he says, And this great, greatly saddened 
and caused distress to Aisha's father, meaning Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr had failed. And the fact that Ali, the younger Ali, was able to do what he was unable to accomplish, Ali, uh, Abu Bakr felt uh, saddened, he felt distressed. وَأَحْزَنَهُ فَطَّغْنَهُ He says he was saddened and he bore a grudge against me. And this is the second, you know, instance where, you know, this uh, this grudge and this animosity surfaces. If you recall, when we spoke about the hijra, when the Prophet sallallahu when he arrived at Quba, he refused to enter Medina until Ali joins him. Abu Bakr says, "Let us, let us go. What do I? Why are you going to wait for Ali?" So when the Prophet refused to enter Medina until Ali joined him, Abu Bakr became frustrated and he entered the city on his own. So here Ali is saying that a second occasion where Abu Bakr felt ghem, he felt distressed and he was saddened, was when I captured the fortress in Khaybar. He says, Wamali ilayhi then. And Ali says that this grudge was unwarranted. I had done nothing wrong to him. Wamali ilayhi then bun fi dalik. Fahakadet lihikdi abiha. Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, one of the reasons why Aisha felt hatred towards me is that this is something that she inherited from her father. She basically, she felt malice towards me because of the malice her father felt. And this is this goes back to uh, what we read in Dua and Nudba, that this, that the, that the accomplishments of Ali ibn Abi Talib, it, it created this jealousy in people. It created jealousy and animosity in the hearts of even some of the closest companions of the Prophet. Now, Shaykh al-Mufid in Kitab al-Irshad, he writes, وَلَمَّا فَتَحَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ الْحِصْنِ After the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, had brought down the fortress. And of course, this specific fortress was the fortress of Na'im, which was uh, the, the fortress from which the imam was able to unhinge the gates. وَقَتَلَ مَرْحَبًا and this was the fortress where Marhab came out. So again, there were a number of fortresses. And after Ali conquered the fortress of Na'im, it completely demoralized them and ultimately they ended up surrendering. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after Amir al Mu'minin brought down the fortress and killed Marhab, and God granted their property, the property of the Jews, as spoils to the Muslims. استأذن حسان بن ثابت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله أن يقول شعرا. Now after, after Amir al-Mu'mineen brought down the fortress and killed Marhab, Hassan bin Thabit, who's one of the uh, companions of the Prophet, he's from the Ansar, and he was... Uh, a very talented poet, one of the most famous poets uh, during the time of the Prophet, he asks permission from Rasulullah to recite a poem about Ali ibn Abi Talib. So what happened uh, in Khaybar at the hands of Ali was so significant that you have the likes of Hassan bin Thabit wanting to recite poetry about it. You know, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes when you read uh, books of the seerah, you know, this, uh, the, account, the contributions of Ali ibn Abi Talib are often, you know, glossed over or they're mentioned, you know, uh, very briefly. However, there's no doubt that just like with the Battle of Khandaq and the Battle of Badr, it was Ali ibn Abi Talib who essentially gave the Muslims uh, victory. 
So Hassan asks for permission, the Prophet, he grants him permission. And among the things that Hassan recites, he says, وَكَانَ عَلِيٌّ أَرْمَدَ الْعَيْنِ يَبْتَغِي Ali was ashen-eyed, needing medicine. He had an eye ailment. يَبْتَغِي دَوَاءً فَلَمَّا لَمْ يَحِسْ مُدَاوِيَا شَفَاهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مِنْهُ بِتَلْفَ بِتَفْلَ So Ali was ashen-eyed, needing medicine. Even then, he did not find the help of anyone to nurse him. The Messenger of Allah healed him with saliva. فَبُورِكَ مَرْقِيًا وَبُورِكَ رَاقِيًا وَقَالَ سَأُعْطِيَ الرَّايَةَ الْيَوْمَ صَارِمًا The Messenger of God healed him with saliva. He blessed the healer. He blessed the healer and he blessed the healed. Meaning Allah blessed the healer, which is the Prophet. And Allah also blessed the one who was healed, which was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, I will give the standard today to a steadfast man, brave, one who loves the messenger as a follower. He loves God and God loves him. كَمْ يَا مُحِبًّا لِلرَّسُولِ مُوَالِيَا يُحِبُّ الْإِلَاهِ وَالْإِلَاهِ يُحِبُّهُ And then he says, بِهِ يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ الْحُصُونَ الْأَوَابِيَا Through him, meaning through Ali, does God overcome the fortress. So Allah is the one who conquers the fortresses, but he does it through the, uh, the medium of Ali ibn Abi Talib, فأصبى, فأصفى بها دون البرية كلها. He distinguished Ali by that apart from all creation. Meaning only Ali will have the honor of being the conqueror of Khaybar. No other companion of the Prophet uh, can be credited with this uh, incredible accomplishment. فأصفى بها دون البرية كلها. So he distinguished Ali by that apart from all other creation and he named him his helper and his brother. So Ali is not just a companion of the Prophet. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the wazir of the Prophet. And this is a reference to Musa and Harun where Musa referring to Harun alayhi salam, he says, وَجْعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي هَارُونَ أَخِي So this brotherhood and this position of being the wazir of the Prophet is the exclusive uh, honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Now once the Muslims had defeated the Jews, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he made the following concessions to them. So, number one, those remaining in the fortresses were allowed to live. And this is basically how the Prophet ﷺ used to operate. The Prophet used to fight and punish those who fight against them. But those who don't fight, oftentimes, if not always, they are, they are spared. So those who were inside of the fortress, even after the battle was finished, right? Those who were remaining in the fortress, they were allowed to live. They were not put to death. Number two, all the Jews, the Prophet said to them, all the Jews must leave Khaybar. They have to basically evacuate. They are to be banished from this land and the surrounding areas. And number three, the Jews must leave all their wealth and weapons and their clothes behind. So they have to leave everything behind. They can only take the clothes on their back. So because many, if not most of the Jews in Khaybar, they were conspiring against the Prophet. Many of them had already committed treason against the Prophet. If you recall, the Banu Nadir, who actually committed treason, who tried to assassinate the Prophet, they were exiled. And now again, the Prophet ﷺ catches them once again, uh, uh, conspiring and, uh, and they were essentially a security threat to the Prophet. Al-Waqidi, 
the famous uh, Muslim historian who died in the year 270 after the Hijrah, he says, وَاسْتَعْمَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ عَلَى الْغَنَائِمِ يَوْمَ خَيْبَرْ فَرْوَةَ بْنَ عَمْرَ الْبَيَّاضِ So the Prophet وآله, according to Al-Waqidi, and this is uh, pretty well established in the books of the Seerah, the Prophet appointed Farwa ibn Amr al-Bayadi to take charge of the distribution. Because there was such an immense amount of wealth, there was an abundance of spoils, the Prophet وآله, actually had to appoint someone to be in charge of the distribution of the spoils. So Al-Waqidi, he says, وَكَانَ قَدْ جَمَعَ مَا غَنَمَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ فِي حُصُونِ النَّطَاتِ وَحُصُونِ الشَّقِّ وَحُصُونُ الْكُتَيْبَةِ أو الكتيبة. So, Farwa basically gathered all of the goods, all of the spoils. And they were gathered in certain fortresses. Of course, there were many fortresses. The, the fortress of Al-Natat, and al shaq and al Kutayba, they were designated as the storages, the storage facilities for the, the spoils. لم يترك على أحد من أهل الكتيبة إلا ثوبا على ظهره من الرجال والنساء والصبيان. So again, those the individuals, the men and the women and the children who were in those specific fortresses, they were not allowed to take anything with them except for the clothes on their back. وَجَمَعُوا أَثَاثًا كَثِيرًا Now you can imagine these fortresses are massive structures. Within them you're going to find rugs, you're going to find uh, chairs, you're going to find an abundance of furniture. So the furniture within the fortresses, they were all gathered and collected. وَبَزَّنْ وَقَطَائِفْ وَسِلَاحًا كَثِيرًا So a lot of weapons, you know, there were probably fabrics and other goods that were within the fortresses. All of that was gathered. And of course, Khaybar was a predominantly an agricultural area. So, so you can imagine the cows and the goats and the sheep, the cattle that was there. All of that was collected and gathered. وَطَعَامًا وَأَدَمًا كَثِيرًا There was a lot of food, fodder for the, the cattle was also there. All of that was collected and housed in these fortresses. And all of this is being done to make the distribution of the spoils more organized. فلم ي... So, فَأَمَّا الطَّعَامَ وَالْأَدَمَ وَالْعَلَفَ فَلَمْ يُخَمَّسْ now, normally what happens is that the Prophet takes his one-fifth because khums is for the Prophet and then the four-fifths are distributed among those who participated in the battle and the Prophet ﷺ would also give uh, to others. As for the food, the food was not part of the khums. The food was basically given to those who were hungry, those who were in need. يَأْخُذُ مِنْهُ النَّاسُ حَاجَتَهُمْ So the Prophet asked for the food, he allowed the Muslims to take what they needed. The food was not part of the distribution of the khums. Now if you recall, brothers and sisters, many of the Muslims were quite poor up until the battle of Khaybar. So many of them uh, you know, did not have the food security. So the food, Muslims basically were free to take as much food as they felt that they needed. Um, what we see is that Al-Waqidi mentions, فَكَانَ أَوَّلُ مَا خَرَجَ سَهْمَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ Now before distributing anything, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله, he, he was given his share his one-fifth. لَمْ يَتَخَيَّرْ فِي الْأَخْمَاسِ ثُمَّ أَمَرَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَمَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ بِبَيْعِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ الْأَخْمَاسِ فِي مَنْ يُرِيدِ Now after the food was taken, 
and all the Muslims were able to procure what they needed in terms of their food. The Prophet, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he told Farwa to sell the rest. Okay? So the Prophet divided the, the spoils into fifths. He chose a fifth for himself, and then the rest was to be sold. Okay? Now, or the, the four fifths was basically to be sold. فَجَعَلَ فَرْوَةَ يَبِيعُهَا فِي مَنْ يُرِيدُ So apparently what happened was that the Muslim soldiers could buy on credit against their share. And the Jews could buy with cash. Because you can imagine there's a lot of stuff. There's cattle, there's rugs, there's furniture. And each Muslim basically has a monetary equivalent. You know, they have their shares. So they can use their shares to select whatever they want. So someone, for example, might want to spend, they, they, maybe they want cattle. Maybe others want furniture. So using their shares, they can pick what they want. Now the Prophet ﷺ also allowed the Jews to purchase from the spoils. So again, if it, so it was originally theirs, but now it belongs to the Muslims. And... The Prophet ﷺ allows them uh, to buy, but of course they don't have any uh, shares, so they have to pay cash. Okay. Now one share was given to infantry, two shares were given to cavalry, and of course this makes sense because you know someone who brings their uh, brings a horse or a camel to the battle, they're they're much more invested. It was more costly for them to participate. In, uh, in the battle. So you can imagine, you know, the journey to Khaybar, they were, the, uh, they uh, besieged uh, the fortresses for 20 days. So this is a lengthy period of time. So think of the amount of money that needs to be spent on maintaining the horses, to maintaining the, the camels. So those who, who were on, uh, who had, uh, so the cavalry were given uh, a greater share. And about half, half a share was given to the women who came as nurses. So the women obviously are not participating in the battle. It's a, it's a lower risk for them, and therefore they receive half of the share that was given to the men. Now the dead soldiers, of course, those who fell and died in the battle of Khaybar, their heirs, you know, for example, the wives, children, they were given, they automatically inherited uh, the share of uh, the shuhada. Now, according to Al Waqidi, the Prophet sallallahu he made a dua to to bless the wealth that was confiscated uh, in Khaybar. He says, "Fada'a fiha Nabi sallallahu alaihi wa alihi bil barakah." The Prophet made a dua to increase the barakah of this wealth of the spoils. وقال اللهم ألق عليها النفاق قال فروة قال فروة بن عمر فلقد رأيت الناس. So the Prophet makes this dua: oh Allah, put baraka in this wealth. Allow us to distribute it in abundance. So Farwa, the man who the companion who is distributing the spoils, he says رأيت الناس يتداركون علي. He says, I felt that the people were rushing towards me. The Muslims were rushing towards me to collect their uh, their spoils. And they were basically, uh, they, they were overwhelming me. They were wrestling to get to me. I was, he says, I was distributing the spoils for two days, non-stop. وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَرَى أَنَّا لَا نَتَخَلَّصُ مِنْهُ حِينًا لِكَثْرَةِ So Farwa says that I was distributing the spoils to the Muslims and he says there was so much to give because of the dua of Rasulullah that I thought that we would never be able to finish the distribution of the spoils uh, in Khaybar. Now, in terms of the, the Prophet's treaty with the Jews of Khaybar, so the people of Khaybar, 
the agreement was that they would give half of their produce to the Muslims. Now you have to understand, brothers and sisters, Khaybar is hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. So, and, and the Muslims basically, uh, and as we'll discuss, they don't have the, the human resources, the manpower to cultivate and to maintain all of this land. So they come to an agreement that the, the Jews would, uh, would work the land and half of the produce would be given to the Muslims. So, ha- so 50% revenue uh, from the agricultural lands in Khaybar amounts to tens and tens of millions of dollars in today's currency. So it's not, a, it's not an insignificant. This is a huge amount of wealth which is now available to the Muslim community. So the, the agreement that the Prophet has is that, okay, you guys can maintain the land, but the, the, the maintenance and the cost and the labor will be 100% on the Jews. right? So this is the agreement that they came to because you would need over a thousand people to, to maintain and to farm the land. And the Prophet ﷺ, he cannot afford to leave a hundred, a thousand Sahaba in Khaybar. It would be a, it would be a security issue. He does, he doesn't want to leave that many, uh, that much of a, uh, a gap in terms of numbers back in Medina. So he allows the Jews to maintain the land, but fifty percent of the revenue is due to the Muslims, and. The treaty is in effect as long as the Muslims decide. Meaning that Rasulullah he reserved the right to terminate the agreement any time that he wished to do so. And of course the Prophet was very fair. In fact, there were some Muslims who were trying to take more of their share. They would just try to take from the produce of Khaybar uh, indiscriminately. And the Prophet rebuked them and he commanded them to adhere to the treaty that he made with the Jews. So what you see here is that the Prophet ﷺ, he shows amazing foresight and wisdom. So he allows the Jews to manage the land because the Muslims don't have experience uh, you know, with, uh, with that type of uh, agriculture. Uh, they don't have the human resources to maintain that massive agricultural enterprise. So it made sense for the Prophet to allow them to uh, to farm the land and to simply collect 50% of the, uh, the produce. So the Muslims then uh, prepare to, to go back to Medina. Now it's important to mention here, my dear brothers and sisters, that the conquest of Khaybar from an economic standpoint was probably the largest conquest in the in the history of Islam up until this point. The territory of Khaybar, you know, this this area that the, that that was now under Muslim control, uh, represented the the most prime real estate. The priciest patches of land are in Khaybar. Uh, the fortresses now belong to the Muslims. The armor, the weapons that they were able to gather, the sheep, the goats, the slaves. You know, now these people are, you know, essentially, they're, uh, they belong to the Muslims. They're slaves. And this is how the pre-modern world was. And it was at this point that the muhajireen, the muhajireen, the emigrants who entered Medina many years back empty-handed, now they've come across this, this new found wealth. So when they returned to Medina, they, uh, the Muhajireen, basically many of them, they returned uh, the land that was given to them by their, uh, by their Ansari brothers and sisters. Uh, if there were loans that were given, many of the Muhajireen essentially paid back those, uh, those loans if there were any outstanding loans. So now the Muhajireen really felt that Okay, Medina is now our. It's now really our home, because prior to Khaybar, many of the Muhajireen felt as though maybe they are a burden upon the Ansar, because the Ansar were providing everything. 
Medina never really felt like home to many of the Muhajireen because they were at a financial disadvantage. Everything that they had was given to them by the Ansar. Now the Muhajireen actually have wealth, right? They have financial independence. So after Khaybar, you see now that the Muhajireen and the Ansar, from a financial perspective, the playing field has now leveled. Okay? And this is where we see that you know, some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they noted, and this just gives you a sense as to you know, how much the early Muslims, how much the Muslims were suffering financially prior to the conquest of Khaybar. Some companions would say, we never ate to our fill until after Khaybar. Because after Khaybar, the Muslim, many of the Muslims became wealthy. Many of the Muslims were no longer uh, financially uh, uh, in need. So the battle of, of Khaybar was, was a huge turning point in terms of the economic security of the Muslim community. Now another important incident that I want to touch upon, which is kind of a, a post Khaybar event, as many of you know, the chief, and we mentioned this in our previous episodes, the chief of Banu Nadir was the infamous Huyay ibn Akhtab. This is a man who was probably one of the most staunch enemies of the Prophet. Him and his tribe, they were exiled, they were banished from Medina for committing treason against the Prophet. So, Huyay ibn Akhtab, of course, he was killed in Khaybar. And his tribe, you know, they were the most uh, uh, they were the most active in fighting against the Prophet and the Muslims in Khaybar. So many of many members, most of the casualties uh, in Khaybar actually came from Banu Nadir. Huyay was killed in Khaybar, and Huyay had a daughter by the name of Safiya. Safiya bint Huyay. Now, Safiya, of course, many of her relatives, because many members of her clan, her cousins, her father, her own husband, they were all killed in, uh, in Khaybar. Now, of course, she's the daughter of the chief. She was a very young woman, a very attractive young woman, and now she's a captive. Now, what typically happens, especially in the pre-modern world, is that the daughter of you know, the chief is usually given to the uh, the conqueror. So, what happens is that Safiya is escorted to the Prophet and Bilal, Bilal ibn Rabah, he basically brings her to see the Prophet. And what Bilal does is that he walks her across the battlefield. And on this battlefield, she sees many of her relatives slain. And she begins crying. So Bilal walks her across the battlefield and she ultimately goes to meet the Prophet. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he sees her crying and Bilal asks, you know, why is why is this woman crying? And Bilal says that I was walking her across the battlefield, and she saw, uh, you know, some of her relatives uh, slain on the battlefield. The Prophet sallallahu he actually rebukes Bilal. He says, "Oh Bilal, why did you do this? Don't you have any mercy in your heart? Why didn't you take her on another path? Why did you have to allow her?" to see her, uh, her cousins and her relatives uh, killed on the battlefield? Why did you expose her to their corpses? Has Allah removed rahmah from your heart? In any case, originally, Safiya was given to a companion by the name of Dihya al-Kalbi. However, because she was the daughter of Huyay, Many of the companions suggested that it would be more appropriate if she is 
if she is given to the Prophet So the Prophet takes her into his custody and in her mind, she's essentially a, a slave to the Prophet. Now one day, you know, Safiya, it's reported that she says to the Prophet, and by the way, there are indications that she was inclined towards Islam. You know, after uh, when she was a young girl, some of the historical accounts mention that she would overhear her father and her uncle talking about the arrival of Muhammad in Medina. And they would talk about how this man, uh, his descriptions are found in the Torah, but because he's not a Jew, we will continue to oppose him. So she grew up listening to these conversations. So she was already inclined uh, to Islam. So Safiya one day, she tells the Prophet about a dream that she had. And the dream was that she saw a bright moon over the city of Medina. And the moon basically moved to Khaybar. So, this, so imagine in the dream, there's a moon in the, um, in the sky of Medina. And it goes towards Khaybar and the moon falls into her lap. So she tells the Prophet this dream and the Prophet ﷺ, he interprets the dream. He basically says that I am, I am that moon. And the Prophet ﷺ, he gives her the choice. He says, listen, I give you a choice now. You are free. You have the choice of returning to your people. You can go and go, return to your community and you can basically uh, live with them and travel with them and settle wherever they choose to settle. Or you can embrace Islam and join my household. And the Prophet ﷺ, he makes this offer to her. Safiya chooses the latter. So imagine, you know, this is the this is the man who basically ends up fighting against her people. Her father is killed, her husband is killed, her relatives are killed, and she embraces the religion of her conqueror. The Prophet gave her the freedom to to go join her people, but she wanted to stay with the Prophet And ultimately the Prophet he, he returns, so the Muslims are wondering, is she going to remain as a concubine or is she going to be uh, taken as a wife? And the Prophet ultimately he frees her and he marries her and she joins uh, his household. Uh, there's an interesting uh, story here where when Safiya arrives in Medina and she joins the household of the Prophet, uh, she was she was treated with a little bit of hostility by some of the other wives, because you know the other wives they used to look at her as you know this is the daughter of that treacherous leader, Huyay ibn Akhtab. So she comes to the Prophet one day and she complains to the Prophet that the other wives are being rude, they're being disrespectful, they're being mean to her. So the Prophet ﷺ, he counsels her to be proud of her Jewish heritage. You know, the other wives of the Prophet, they would say that, they would say to Rasulullah ﷺ that, you know, we are the wives of the Prophet and we're related to the Prophet. Because many of them were somehow related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So Rasulullah tells Safiya, why didn't you reply to them? You know, they were basically trying to insinuate that you are inferior to them because they are the wives of the Messenger of God and they're also related to the Prophet. So the Prophet says to Safiya, why didn't you reply to them? How can you be superior to me when Aaron, when Harun is my father? So uh, she was a Levite Jew. She was from the progeny of Harun. So say to them, how can you be superior to me when Harun is my father and Musa السلام, is my uncle and my husband is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this is the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi made her transition from being a captive into a wife uh, and a member of uh, his household more smoothly. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak about the return of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib from the land of Habasha. And we'll speak about the way that the Prophet receives him 
and inshallah we'll speak a little bit about a special gift that the Prophet gave to Ja'far when he returned uh, from Habasha. Thank you so much brothers and sisters for tuning in once again and I look forward to having you join me on future episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, Sheikh. And uh, so if the, the Jews were left behind at Khaybar, then who was it who was exiled and had to leave their property behind? So all of them were exiled. The, the, the ones who were in the fortress, they were they were allowed to live, meaning that they weren't put to death. But then there was a large contingent left behind who was uh, working the land under the yes. Yeah, so so so, 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 right? so that so so that agreement came later on. You know when when the Prophet saw the vastness of the land. You know this was after the negotiations. Um, because the Jews were basically wanted to stay on the land, and they were making the case to the Prophet that you know we have more experience in farming this land. So the Prophet after long, lengthy negotiations, he decided to allow them to uh, to stay, uh, provided that they receive fifty percent of the produce. So are you saying they were like first exiled, but then later allowed to stay? So it seems that, again, we don't know how many there were. So there were a number of them who were definitely exiled, but perhaps the Prophet retained uh, uh, a number, what, what he needed for, uh, for this land to be cultivated. Yes. Yeah, so they were all exiled, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then negotiations uh, happened after that initial announcement. And then uh, it seems that the Prophet Sallallahu retained uh, a group of them, probably close to a thousand, I would say, who uh, who basically remained there to just farm the land. And of course, and... All, all of their weapons were taken; everything else was taken. So they basically had to uh, they had to start from zero. All their wealth, their weapons, everything was confiscated. And uh, one other thing that was surprising was that he was so, some of the like the war loot was sold back to the Jews. Uh, how how is that possible if all that all their money was confiscated? So that's a good question. I mean, you have to you have to remember that the Jews of Khaybar are not the only Jews that. Uh, that basically lived in the Arabian Peninsula. It's possible that they were allowed to to basically obtain cash from you know their other brethren or Jewish relatives if they wanted to purchase uh, purchase their material. Yeah, that's the only that's the only uh, way that I think we can harmonize these reports. So is it that like the Khaybar Fort was like a, a limited section? But there were like more Jewish populations living right around that area within like less than a day's walk, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. And inshallah, in, in our coming episodes, we'll speak about Fedek. So you also have Jews in Fedek who did not even put up a fight. And they they, they basically wanted to come to uh, an agreement and have a truce with the Prophet. So yes, there were definitely Jews uh, who lived uh, locally who were close by. Uh, that they they could have they could presumably get cash from to purchase some of the spoils back. And uh, what force uh, do we know if some of the Muslims stayed behind at Khaybar and like actually took over parts of the land? I don't know. I mean, I, we don't have those details. Um, but I I would imagine that that the, I don't think the Prophet is just going to leave them completely unattended. I would imagine that there's someone who's going to kind of just provide some oversight and maybe just manage. So I imagine that there's going to be some, you know, probably a small group who are just going to keep tabs on them. But uh, but definitely the uh, the actual manual labor, the work was being done by the Jews. And 
more uh, i guess it's more general to like the war but uh, how would widows and orphans be supported usually beyond just uh, the share from that one battle i mean they, they would receive uh they would receive a stipend from Beitul Mal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they would they, they basically would receive a stipend from Beitul Mal. And and again, we, we can't we can't forget that there are there are a number of so in in, in the Islamic worldview, a woman is never to be put in a position where she actually has to provide financially for herself. So either she's supported by Beitul Mal. Or she gets remarried. It's a question of why did the Bunny Israel tag get replaced by the Jews? I guess why did the name change? Or what, what, when did the name change? Why did the name change from Bunny Israel to, uh, to the Jews? Right. I think they're used there. I don't think it was changed. They're used interchangeably. Even if you look at the the Bible, they're used interchangeably. Uh, you know, sometimes you have Jews, Gentiles. Sometimes you have Bene Israel, and so they're both titles are uh, are. And this is even in the Quran. Sometimes Allah refers to the Jews as Al Yahud. Sometimes He refers to them as Bene Israel. Thank so that they, much, yeah, yeah they're, they're, so it wasn't it wasn't replaced. They're they're used and they're oftentimes synonymous terms.